Wisdom's value. But wisdom, where can it be found? Where is the place of understanding? Humankind does not know its value. It isn't found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not with me. The sea says, not alongside me. It can't not be bought with gold. Its price can't be measured in silver. It can't be weighed against gold from Orphira with precious onyx or lapis luzi. Neither gold nor glass can compare with it. She can't be acquired with gold jewelry, coral, and jasper shouldn't be mentioned. The priceless wisdom is more than rubies. Couchette Topaz won't compare with her. She can't be set alongside pure gold. But wisdom, where does she come from? Where is the place of understanding? She is hidden from the eyes of all the living, concealed from the birds of the sky. Destruction and death have said, we have heard a report of her. God understands her way. He knows her place, for he looks to the ends of the earth and surveys everything beneath the heavens. In order to weigh the wind, to prepare a measure for waters, when he made a decree for the rain, a path for thunderbolts, he observed it, spoke of it, established it, searched it out, and said to humankind, Look, the fear of God is wisdom. Turning from evil is understanding. I'm curious, as we get started this week with the teaching time of our service, how many of you have read the book of Job? If you would let me know in the comment section of this video or send me a text message, Facebook message, email, um, just to let me know if you've read it and what your experience is of it. Now, I know not all of us have. The, old, the book of Job is found in the Old Testament, and I just want to set a little bit of context for you. If you imagine the opening prose section of Job like a movie, it would open like a pastoral scene. We see this man who is wealthy, yes, but he's wealthy because he's a rancher. He has many children who he worries about. He has livestock that he takes care of but he's a pious man. So we would see him praying a lot. We would see him offering sacrifices to God. And then the scene zooms and it almost becomes this scene like you used to see in like old movies about the Greek gods and goddesses or maybe not so old Disney movies where we're up in Mount Olympus and it's a pantheon. God the Most High, El Elohim is gathered in his court and around him are all these divine beings. Now I keep saying him and maybe as you're building this picture, God is the disembodied head of the Wizard of Oz or God is a white dude with a long white beard sitting on kind of a judgment throne or maybe in your head God is Morgan Freeman from Bruce Almighty or even Alanis Morissette from Dogma. However you're picturing God right now, we're probably wrong, but keep picturing it, right? So God is on God's throne and has called in all these divine beings and enter this character that in our Bibles is probably called Satan. And in Hebrew is actually called Hasatan, which means the accuser. So if you were reading the word Satan in your Bible, you probably, of course, immediately jumped to the cartoon, red skin, bull horns, pointed tail, pitchfork. But when we hear the word accuser, the accuser, maybe your image flips a little bit to something that looks more like your stereotypical prosecuting attorney. Sorry to all the actual lawyers out there, but you know how you're portrayed in Hollywood, right? Neatly tailored suits, perfectly coiffed hair, flawless skin, and just a little bit of a sly, mischievous smile, as if I know something you don't know. And that is exactly what happens in this exchange. Hashem, the name, God, looks at Hasatan and says, where have you been? And Hasatan, we imagine, or we could imagine, with a slinky, know-it-all facial expression says, from going back and forth to and fro in the world. And God reacts in what we imagine might be a defensive reaction. 
have you considered my servant Job? This person that we met at the beginning of the movie, this righteous man who is wealthy. And Hasatown's response is, does Job praise God for nothing? God has protected Job's interest. Job is wealthy, as if to imply that it is easy to praise God when one is healthy and comfortable and has many children. And boy, if that isn't true. And so the Hasatan character and God make a bet. And over the course of the next couple days, the Hasatan character is allowed to take away Job's wealth. All of his livestock is stolen by enemies, carried away to foreign lands. His children are killed. When they are all having supper together, there is a great wind that comes up and it smashes their house. And the thing that seems to happen is that all of this happens in one day, or at least Job gets word of it all in one day. The scene is messengers rushing in. I've come to tell you that your camels are gone. I've come to tell you that your goats are gone. I've come to tell you that your sheep are gone. I've come to tell you that your children are all dead. And Job rends his clothes, which is a normal act of mourning at this time. He rends his clothes and he mourns. And then the Hasatan character is allowed to affect his health, and we're told that he develops sores on his skin. And so our scene continues with Job, this one's wealthy, pious man, alone, sitting on a pile of ashes, scraping his sores with a pot shard. Now, it sounds disgusting, but we imagine that if they're boils, pustules, he's scraping his wounds to pull out the infection, to run. So now we've got ash heap, sores, pus down his arm, ripped clothes, maybe shaved head, dirty face. And Job has three friends that show up. Friends. These are helpful friends that, that unfortunately some of us have experienced in our times of grief. Job's three helpful friends show up, and at first they're wonderful. They sit Shiva with Job. They sit with him in silence in his grief, and they do not speak until Job speaks. And when Job opens his mouth, I hope you go and read this, because it will make you question the patience of Job. When Job opens his mouth, he immediately goes on a rant, understandably so. Job unleashes this anger at God. Job unleashes this bitterness of even being born. God, why bother putting me here on earth if you are going to take everything away from me? And Job's incredibly helpful friends answer him with platitudes. Well, Job, you know, if God did this to you, you must have sinned somehow. No, Job, you can't deny it. You must have done something wrong. Have you all experienced these helpful platitudes from friends in the midst of your grief? God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Or God needed another angel in heaven. Sometimes people run out of things to say. And so they find themselves saying these strange things. But Job's friends are even worse than that. They look at Job and they say, you did something to deserve this punishment. You need to confess your sin for this loss and God will forgive you and restore you. And Job fights back. And the argument goes back and forth and back and forth between Job and his oh so helpful three friends for a long time. And then we come to this passage in chapter 28, which is in the middle of one of Job's speeches. And it becomes this poem to wisdom. It becomes, first of all, this poem to human ingenuity. It starts off with iron is picked up from the ground and we find these precious gems and we clean them up and extract them from the dirt and humans are amazing. And then it ends with, and it counts for nothing. It counts for nothing. You can 
strive and strive and strive and strive and strive. And there is no wisdom in human ingenuity. The only wisdom that is available is that which comes from God, from fear of the Lord, which isn't afraid as in, I'm afraid of spiders or I get freaked out whenever there's a tornado warning. Fear of the Lord is kind of like fear we might have if we were to encounter a lion in the wild. There's awe and respect and a sense that this being that we're around is dangerous and could take our life and should be treated as such. Fear of the Lord is wisdom, is the beginning of wisdom. Now there's a lot of scholars who believe that chapter 28 doesn't belong in the book of Job because it's such a turn for Job. Job so far has just been, what are you doing God? There's a belief that the brilliant writer of the arguments back and forth in Job, which is some of the best poetry found in the Hebrew Bible, that he had this other, he or she, had this other piece of work, this chapter 28, and an author, a compiler of the book of Job, found this other piece of poetry and went, oh, this is too lovely to pass up, plunk. That's what one of the theories that scholarship has. I'm a little curious because I've been in grief myself and I think it might be possible that the speech does belong to Job because for a long time in Job's life, Job was a beneficiary of human ingenuity, his own ingenuity. He benefited from his ability to have all this livestock and to manage a household and to have servants around him that worked for his flourishing and for the flourishing of his children. And so Matt, it might be true that Job could speak words in praise of human ingenuity, but then sitting on an ash heap covered in dust, rich clothes rended, scraping with the pot shard to pull the pus out of his wounds so that his arm didn't get infected and fall off. If Job has a glimpse that ultimately human beings have no control all of our ingenuity, all of our inventions, all of our striving eventually come to nothing. As beautiful as those gems are that we can pull from the earth, as glorious as it is to have that wealth available to us, ultimately it all comes to nothing. You've heard yet the other helpful cliche, you can't take it with you when you go. It's very true. It's very true about our material wealth. But the things that do last is our relationship with God. Now, the thrilling conclusion of the book of Job, in case you're curious, is that God eventually shows up. And God shows up in a whirlwind. This is not the still small voice of God that Elijah experiences. God comes in a tornado and God answers. And God's answer to Job isn't comforting either. It's who are you to question me? That's, jo that's God's answer to Job. But then God goes on and on and on. And the end of it is for God to look at Job's friends and say, Job got it right. And you should ask him to sacrifice for you. So maybe, just maybe, in chapter 28 and throughout the rest of Job's rant, where he concedes that, we don't know what God is thinking. That somehow in the midst of this, Job is on a path to true wisdom. There's an unraveling that goes along with this epiphany. The unraveling is of something that even we as Americans cling tightly to. It's the unraveling that we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps that one can work hard enough just on one's own steam to make one's own dreams come true. And once one's dreams come true, one is safe from heartache and loss. That one can effort oneself into your best life now. Except loss and tragedy affect us all. 
It doesn't matter how smart we are, how many skills we have, what things we can do with our hands. We are all susceptible to loss and to grief. At any moment, that thing that we hold most dear could be snatched away from us. There's an unraveling in that. An unraveling that leads to the path of greater wisdom. And the greater wisdom comes from fear of the Lord. All we can do, all we are capable of for wisdom is to wait and to receive and to see what God has for us to stand in awe in the presence of God. One of the things that I've loved about coming to you online is that I get to record sermons from places that you may not get to see very often. And where I'm at is in front of one of my favorite windows in the church. I'm gonna change the focus a little bit. Hopefully you can see it a little more clearly. I stare at this window every Sunday morning. And the image in it is a hand reaching down, reaching down towards people. It's almost as if to communicate to us, much like was communicated through Job to his friends, that it doesn't matter what we do. What matters is what we're ready to receive. Are we ready to receive God, to receive who God is, to stand in the presence of God, to experience awe and fear, to be overcome by that feeling. And in the midst of receiving that awe and fear, in the midst of receiving the revelation of who God is, are we open to the wisdom that God leads us toward? Are we ready to admit that every single human being, every single human being stands able and ready to receive the wisdom that God is willing to give? Can we unravel our privilege, unravel our entitlement, unravel the pride we have in ourselves and in human ingenuity enough to see that really what we're called to do is to receive what God has for us and to walk in the path of wisdom. That is my prayer for all of us today and all days. Amen.